Hello, folks. Um, hello, all the attendees out there. Just want to say thank you for signing into our um, seminar here, Benefits of Progressive Cavity Pumps. We've got three people on our end um, that are involved in this. The first one is Chris Davis. He's our CPEX Regional Manager. Uh, he's going to actually be doing the presentation today. We have Sherry McNamara, who actually helps put this whole thing together. And without her, this wouldn't wouldn't go. She's the brains of our operation. And myself, Kevin Conway, Seward Equipment. Um, a couple housekeeping notes. Under handouts, you're going to notice there's two. One of them is the PowerPoint presentation that you can download. The other one is your certificate, which has your numbers for either DOH, DEC, or the PI credits, and there's one credit for each, so you do need to download those before the um, seminar is over today. You will get a notice about an hour after the seminar with a link to those also, just in case you can't get them during the day, but we highly recommend that you try to get them done during the presentation. Now, there is questions that are going to be asked. If you have a question, just submit it to the box. And what we're going to try to do is answer them all at the end of it so everybody in the in, in attendance can have benefits of the uh, getting the answers on the questions. And all questions are welcome. So with regard to that, I'm going to turn over to Chris Davis. Again, he's our regional manager from CPEX Pumps. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks, everyone in attendance today. Thank you for the opportunity to present on progressive cavity pumps. Uh, my name is Chris Davis. I've been with CPEX for uh, roughly years, which is a U.S. progressive cavity pump manufacturer out of Dayton, Ohio. I cover the territory from eastern Canada all the way down to Virginia and out west to West Virginia and Pennsylvania, which they would consider the northeast uh, territory. Been in the pump industry for roughly 10 years. Um, today's course will be considered a level one for credits and a basic overview of progressive cavity pumps. I'm not specifically talking about any um, specific brand, but it's the technology overall, the pros and cons of the technology, and where it actually can be utilized in water and wastewater treatment processes. So we'll break this up into two sections. The first one will be the benefits of the progressive cavity pump. And the second one will help, how, how does the pump actually perform? How does it actually work as far as the technology goes? So seeing that we do these lunch and learns, I really love showing where some of these progressive cavity pumps are installed um, in food and beverage applications that we never even really think of. So anything from pumping potatoes, To the wine industry pumping grapes, the dairy industry pumping butters and sour creams and cheeses, and even in the poultry and the meat industry in pumping things like uh, dead ducks, dead chickens, dead fish, a lot of waste removal processes. So progressive cavity pumps as a whole Sometimes they're looked at as the pump of last resort because when they've tried other types of technology to move a product and have failed, they look to progressive cavity pumps because the rule of thumb is if you can get the product into the pump, the progressive cavity pump will move it down the line. So with that being said, today we'll mainly focus on where these pumps are used in the water and wastewater industry. We'll just some other examples um, because CPEX and other progressive cavity pump manufacturers are diversified enough. It's a rather simple pump and how it operates, but it's extremely diverse in the amount of applications and markets that it's used in. So the benefits of a progressive cavity pump, also called a PC pump or a single screw pump, or sometimes even called a worm pump, it's considered a positive because a fixed volume is displaced each time that the rotor actually inside of the stator of the pump. So we have a rotor, which is a single helix, and that rolls eccentrically in the stator, which is a double helix. When you combine these, okay, with compression, there's pockets or cavities that are created. And as that rotor turns and moves towards the discharge end of the pump, it will start to produce flow in a laminar fashion. This is a nice animation showing 
the rotor and the stator turning roughly around 300 RPM, maybe 250 RPM, which is typically what these pumps are sized for. Most of these pumps are configured in a flooded suction application. However, they can be run in suction lift applications as well, but a product such as maybe a sludge or a chemical at a wastewater or water treatment plant would enter the pump here in the suction housing and would work its way through the cavities that are formed from the rotor, also called the worm, that's compressed inside of the stator. And as it pumps, it can overcome pretty high discharge pressures and still produce laminar flow. Up here is just showing a nice animation of what those cavities would actually look like the path that uh, media would take through that pump. Some of the benefits of using a progressive cavity pump in the water and wastewater industry, this is a non-pulsating positive displacement pump. There's no need for pulsation dampeners or check valves with this type of technology. This type of pump is used to pump abrasive fluids. It's used a ton in the pulp and paper industry for pumping slurries and in industrial uh, chemical processing as well in the lithium ion battery industry where they're pumping heavy, heavy abrasive slurries. And in the wastewater industry, we would be looking at these for maybe primary sludge, um, some secondary sludge as well, but primary sludge would maybe have some sand or grit. Uh, where I live in Rhode Island, a lot of the wastewater plants have issues because they're near the beaches. So this is where we'd, you, you would use a um, progressive cavity pump. Most of the abrasive wear though is attributed to slip and speed. We'll discuss that a little bit later in the presentation on how we size these pumps. Um, limiting this, the actual speed of the RPM of the pump will allow the abrasive particles to pass more effectively and give you longer life of your wear parts. Another reason to use a progressive cavity pump is that there is a really low NPSH net positive suction head requirement. So the, the capacity of the pump will stay constant even under different suction conditions. And lastly, another benefit would be the low shear pumping action. The progressive cavity pump due to its design is actually the lowest shear per, uh, positive displacement pump on the market. You will see this on most, uh, almost all of polymer applications. You'll see a progressive cavity pump on it. You don't wanna shear your polymer chain. You wanna keep that bond as, as long and stretch that as far as possible. So you would not want to import shear into your product. You'd use a progressive cavity pump too. You'd be hard pressed in the dairy industry, especially in the yogurt industry. Um, Shabani is actually a, a, a huge user um, of progressive cavity pumps, but for pumping yogurts and lotions and um, things that you don't want to separate, you want to keep it homogenous, you would most likely use a progressive cavity pump for those type of applications. Here's a nice animation of a progressive cavity pump. No specific brand. What I like about this animation is you can see the pump operating, pumping a slurry. There's little bits and tiny pieces of solids in there. This is what we call the suction housing, where it houses our joints and the coupling rod that connects your drive end to your actual pumping element, which is your rotor and stator. You can see the rotors turning again around 300 RPM. There's cavities that are opening and closing. It's working on a compression fit. And so on the discharge end of the pump, you can see it's laminar flow. There's no pulsating characteristics here. What's really interesting is you'll see now if you stop this pump and reverse the rotation, it will actually pull the slurry into the pump reverse the rotation again, and now we'll pump that slurry. So just by changing the rotation of the pump, um, we are able to move we are able to move uh, fluids through the pump effectively. Okay, some other benefits of the progressive cavity pump. As far as discharge pressure goes, discharge pressure is actually independent of the speed of the pump, okay? So this type of pump, due to its compression fit, can overcome pressure and discharge line losses. 
The flow, however, is directly proportional to the speed of the progressive cavity pump. So these are extremely useful in, let's say, a water treatment account that needs to accurately dose chemical. Uh, from calibrating these pumps, our curves are linear, which I'll show on a little bit later slide. So as long as you knew that your pump at a certain RPM was always going to produce a certain flow, it's very easy to calibrate because an operator could come out and see, let's say this pump was getting tired, it always used to produce 10 gallons a minute at 100 RPM, and now we're only getting 7 gallons a minute at 100 RPM. So there's either a blockage to the pump or two, there seems to be some significant wear of the pump, but you have predictive maintenance that allows the operator time to get some spare parts for that pump or overcompensate it by speeding that pump up. There's no valves needed uh, due to that compression fit. The pump itself actually works like a check valve. If it is not turning, the pump is not on and rotating. There should be no path for a leak. There should be no room for the uh, fluid to get through that pump, okay? These are extremely quiet pumps, believe it or not. The loudest thing on it would mainly be the fan on the gear motor. And another um, huge benefit to this pump is that we can pump solids. We showed that video earlier of the dead ducks on the pump, but when we look at primary sludge, maybe with a plant that doesn't have the best screening technology, you know, if there were some small towels, rags, um, kids' toys, any sort of solids that could get into that, um, this pump, as long as we have sized the cavities large enough in it, can handle that and can pump that through fairly easily. For sodium hypochlorite, you would want to look at a progressive cavity pump because this pump does not vapor lock. It is a very unique thing with this type of positive displacement technology, but uh, one of our fastest growing markets as progressive cavity pump manufacturers is sodium hypochlorite and any other types of fluids that have gassing capabilities. The key though on these pumps is that they cannot run dry. We'll discuss that a little bit later. So even though this pump can move gas, you would like to try to find a way to vent that if possible and keep the pumps in a flooded suction orientation. The quickest way to destroy these pumps is to run them dry for a long period of time at a fast RPM. The pump will start to make a noise like your windshield wipers on your windshield on a day that it's not raining. If you were to just turn your windshield wipers on on a sunny day and hear that squeegee noise and that rubbing of the uh, rubber on your windshield, that's the typical sound you would hear inside of the progressive cavity pump due to the compression fit between the rotor and the stator. Uh, suction lifts, as we showed you in that video, just by reversing the rotation of this pump, we can actually self-prime and pull fluid to it. So um, when the cavities in the pumps are properly sealed, when there is a nice tight compression, this pump can pull very, very high suction lifts. Um, when we look at the materials of construction of these pumps, we can pump a lot of corrosive and a wide range of chemicals as well with various pH ranges just by changing the elastomers and the rotor metal uh, in that pump. So by having the right combination of a stator with the correct compatible elastomer as well as with the rotor, uh, we can cover a very large range of chemicals that can be pumped. And then lastly, we've already talked about this, but these pumps are reversible. So if you needed to clear a line, if you needed to um, have a self-priming suction lift application, you can just change the rotation of the pump from counterclockwise instead to clockwise. Fluid temperatures, not something we really worry about a ton in environmental um, applications for water and wastewater. However, due to the um, design of these pumps, we can find stators that will allow the pump to operate up to temperatures of around 350 degrees Fahrenheit. These are self-priming pumps, which we touched on earlier. So the pump is capable of pumping air until the product actually makes its way to the pump and fills the cavities. Typically what we would do to avoid a run dry situation is we would have this pump self-priming at a low RPM. So probably something around 50 RPM or lower. That will keep um, the heat buildup at a minimum between the rotor and stator as it's turning without fluid in it. 
And realistically, the pump can run dry. You just don't want to do it for a long period of time and you don't want to do it at a high speed because that will actually create that heat that will cause the destruction of the pump. When we look at um, high solids concentration, another benefit of progressive cavity pumps, which we'll show you a little bit later, is we can go up to about 45 to 50% solids on your thickened sludge and cake applications, okay? And even 90% on some industrial applications we've accomplished, just by changing the design of the pump, opening up the suction housing of that pump, and sometimes adding in various augers and bridge breakers, different things to help that media get into the suction of the pump, as I stated before, what's interesting about these pumps, the rule of thumb, if you can get it into the suction housing of the pump, it will move it. Um, so there's different things that we do with special um, pump manufacturing techniques to actually help that product enter the pump. And the flow, what's interesting is even at these higher solids percentages, we're gonna be working against a higher discharge pressure but the flow is still directly correlated to RPM, not to discharge pressure. So much, much differently than um, centrifugal pumps and some other type of positive displacement pumps. When we look at the, um, the length of the life of the spare parts, okay, it really comes down to the long seal life, okay? So if we can extend the seal lines between the rotor and the stator and that compression fit on a normal flow path, okay, uh, we should be able to extend the life of that pump. Lastly, this last bullet point here is about mechanical seal life. What's really nice is if these pumps are in a flooded suction application, the mechanical seal, I'll point it out uh, in another slide, but it really only sees suction pressure. So with the um, slow RPM of this pump, you won't build up any heat between the seal faces, running a pump less than 350 RPM. So that's good for your mechanical seal. And two is that it only will see suction pressure, not discharge pressure. So typically you do not seal, see mechanical seal failures on progressive cavity pumps. It's, it's a pretty rare event. Now when we look at a progressive cavity pump versus other positive displacement pump competition and the ranges of what they can hit as far as viscosity, pressure and flow, but also looking at pulsation and NPSHR and even abrasiveness, okay? The, the red areas here are what we as progressive cavity pump manufacturers have diagnosed as where competition lies, okay? So other positive displacement pumps may be better fit for certain applications, maybe on footprint, maybe on upfront cost. Um, however, this is really the range that they can plan whereas progressive cavity pumps have been known to go up to 10 million centipoise in the field, have hit pressures as high as 720 PSI, extremely low MPSHR requirements because of our suction lift capabilities, heavy, heavy abrasive slurries. You know, these pumps are used a ton in the mining industry as well for pumping, let's say mining um, runoff water. And uh, that would be considered a heavy abrasive application. So pumping a primary sludge is really no sweat. Flows, these pumps can go up to 2,200 gallons per minute and very, very low um, pulsation, if at all, with this style of pump as well. So predominantly used, our fastest growing market now in the water treatment industry is actually dosing of chemicals. So how does a progressive cavity pump work? We've touched on this, but you have your rotor, also called the worm. That's your single helix, manufactured in a lot of different ways by different um, progressive cavity pump companies. And then you have your stator, which is really your main wear element here. This is what takes a beating here on the pump. And if this is compromised, if this starts to break apart, if this is damaged in any way, the pump really isn't going to operate the way it should. But your stator is your double helix, so it really doesn't matter. It can be flipped, it can be put on upside down, it really doesn't matter. Um, this rotor will always fit inside of it. The key is to make sure that it has that nice tight compression fit and that you have the proper seal lines. Looks like we have a poll question coming up. Okay, for the attendees out there, Question number one, 
Actually, let me get this over here. What are the two main elements that do the pumping on a PC pump? A would be rotor, stator. B would be motor and gearbox. C would be the mechanical seal and the universal joints. And D would be the impeller in the shaft. I hope everybody gets the right answer here. Almost at 90%, so I'm going to close it in about five seconds. Okay, the answer is A, rotor, stator are the two main elements that do the pumping on a PC pump. Back to you, Chris. All right, Kevin, I hope we got the right answer. If not, we're gonna have to go all the way back to the beginning and start this on slide one. But um, what, what are we looking at, Kevin? Does it give you the results? Yes, it was uh, the majority had rotor and stator. Fantastic, let's move on. So how do progressive cavity pumps work? Moving on to slide two here. Uh, the flow is moved into the cavity of the pump, okay? The rotor that's inside of that stator Flow will not move through that area unless it is turning. Okay, what I really like about this slide here is you can actually see here the compression fit for how this pump works. We've shaded the areas where that rotor or that worm actually makes a tight fit and a seal with the stator. Okay, if these seal lines really start to wear and degrade and start to uh, shorten, in its um, size, the pump will start to have slippage, which we'll cover in a, a slide here in a couple minutes. This is a great animation um, where this pump is actually moving like a type of lotion, but you can see the path of the lotion actually going through the pump as it's turning. and moving its way through the cavities of that pump. Start it again from the beginning here. This pump's turning really slow. This is less than 50 RPM. This is probably a heavier viscosity for that reason. Um, but you can really see that fluid making its way through the pump. So due to this design and this compression fit, progressive cavity pumps have a non-pulsating flow, okay? There's no pulsation dampeners needed. It saves you a ton on the footprint of the pump and the upfront cost of this equipment. There's no check valves needed because of its um, design. And when the rotor and stator is properly combined, you have these cavities. And if the cavities progress, it creates a spiral motion through the pump and on the discharge side, you will have uninterrupted continuous flow. So if you have solids in the type of material that you wanna pump, what you need to keep in mind is to give that to the progressive cavity pump manufacturer. And on the engineering side, we make sure that we size the stator with a large enough cavity when the pump is still in its compression fit in order to be able to move the max solid that's in the fluid. So some of the pumps that maybe have very little solids in it, you'll have a really tight fit here and a much smaller cavity size. Some of the pumps that are used on maybe primary sludge would have a larger cavity size to move, to move some types of fluids, sorry, to move some types of solids in the fluid. And then lastly is for some of these pumps that need to move a high volume of uh, fluid, you know, we're talking into the 500, 600 gallon range, you'd see that those progressive cavity pumps would have a larger cavity strictly just for moving that larger volume of flow. So when we're pumping abrasive fluids, again, you can see here is the compression area where that rotor actually rides along on the stator. We need to take that into account when we're pump pumping abrasives, okay? 
Um, what we try to do is add stages to the pump. We actually lengthen the rotor and the stator on that pump to create more of these seal lines to then combat that abrasion, okay? If we have to limit the speed, that will also help. So for abrasive applications, again, for the environmental industry, that would mainly be like a lime slurry. Uh, that would be maybe some diatomaceous earth. That would be primary sludge. Um, those are the applications where when you looked at a progressive cavity pump, we would probably keep in mind that we would want to lengthen the rotor and stator a bit and pump at a slower RPM. If you don't do that, let's say you do start to have wear on your seal lines on your progressive cavity pump, you will have what we call slippage or internal liquid or internal leakage, also called recirculation, because the pump is going to continue to turn and try to make the fluid uh, get through the pump in a spiral fashion. But if the high discharge pressure combined with the damaging of these seal lines here, the pump will actually start to work like a gear pump and just keep recirculating in here. Okay, it needs a tight compression, compression fit between the rotor and the stator. So how do we do that? Okay, Some of the things that we do, again, is looking at the RPM of the pump and trying to keep it between a, maybe a 50 and 100 RPM, less than that. And then the last thing we do is look at adding more stages, which means basically lengthening the rotor here, which adds more of these cavities and more seal lines to combat that, uh, that abrasion. So when we look at how we size these pumps, we size them in stages. A single stage pump is a pump that can operate from zero to 90 PSI on the discharge pressure. A two-stage pump, as you can see, we're adding on more cavities here. This pump can operate from zero to 180 PSI. And then on a three-stage pump, although those really aren't found in the industry anymore, so for a four-stage pump, we would actually double that again. That pump could operate to 360 PSI on the discharge side. So we may add additional stages to the pump and derate it, okay, in order to combat abrasion. Another thing that maybe is done is that if there's a high temperature as well, which would cause the stator maybe to swell, we would undersize the rotor. We would actually cut the rotor and reduce the diameter of that rotor so that when that stator swells, it then creates that tight compression fit for us. So again, when we're sizing these pumps and we need to go to higher discharge pressures, okay, we have to increase the length of that rotor in order to create more pockets to overcome a certain discharge pressure. If you see a massive progressive cavity pump at a plant, there's two reasons for that. One, it probably has a very high flow requirement, okay? Or two, it probably is pumping against an extremely high discharge pressure. And that could be for a number of reasons. One could be on the viscosity of the pressure, sorry, the viscosity of the fluid. So if you have a high viscosity, pumping that through, uh, let's say a three or four inch pipe, um, you could have some high pressures there and you may need more of these seal lines on this rotor and stator to overcome that discharge pressure. Typically one of these pockets can hold 15 PSI. So the more of those pockets that we have, and you look at this type of longer, this is a four stage rotor here, that can overcome 360 PSI. Just by increasing the length of that pump on an abrasive application, you will also now increase the length of the spare parts life. So for us as progressive cavity pump manufacturers, we have to be smart in how we engineer and size these pumps because we don't always want to stick a massive pump into an application, but we need to find the healthy relationship between the abrasiveness, the pressure of the application, the flow requirements, and then lastly is the viscosity here. So when we look at uh, how progressive cavity pumps operate, they are actually happier, they have a higher efficiency pumping a higher viscosity than a lower viscosity. So a perfect example would be progressive cavity pump would prefer to move something like a polymer 
or a sludge, we would be happier moving that type of material than just plain water. With water, we have a higher slippage rate versus something like uh, a lotion or a polymer or a sludge. So wear is exponential to speed. Slowing down a progressive cavity pump will then minimize the wear. Another thing we can do as discussed is we can derate the pressure for stage, which will increase the rotor and stator life. So we will increase the size of that pump in order to combat the abrasiveness. Down below are characteristics of different fluids that we pump and their abrasive characteristics. And what we do as far as progressive cavity pumps on the stages and the derating of it. So mainly we would play here for pumping like a primary or secondary sludge. You know, we may move to a two stage pump when we really don't need it if the pressure is getting up, you know, around 40 to 50 PSI in that application. We may look to increase the size of that pump in some applications in order to make sure that those wear parts last longer. This is an example of a progressive cavity pump curve to show you how we size these pumps. So on the bottom here would be the RPM, and on the left side you have your flow. So against various pressures, you have four different curves that the pump could follow. What's really nice is from the calibration point of view, if you were a water or a wastewater treatment operator and you knew that your pump always operated at 200 RPM, and at 200 RPM, you always got 10 gallons a minute of flow out of that pump. Again, from the preventative maintenance point of view and from calibrating and looking at when you need to replace spare parts, if always at 200 RPM, you got 10 gallons a minute, and now at 200 RPM, you're only getting five gallons a minute, you know that this pump has had some significant wear and is running off of its curve, and maybe it's time to either speed it up to overcompensate or two, you would probably look at getting some spare parts here and get a fresh rotor and stator to get that compression fit back and get you back to your original tolerances. So now when we look at intake efficiency, which is another important thing in sizing progressive cavity pumps, the more viscous, the thicker that a fluid is, the thicker that that sludge is when we turn into, let's say, um, the watered sludge or cake, uh, we need to slow down the pump. We need to find the healthy relationship between how do we uh, how do we get the flow that we need while also being able to feed the pump with this thicker product. So even at a reduced speed, sometimes the pump is not going to have 100% intake efficiency. So it has to be accounted for. How do we get that perfect desired flow rate while also operating at an acceptable intake efficiency? Um, so if a pump, for, for example, needs to run at 100 RPM on water to give you one gallon a minute, but now you've got a product that's 10,000 centipoise that's giving you 70% intake efficiency, you're going to need to run your pump at 143 RPM just to get your one gallon a minute. So you need to be a little bit cautious when taking on the higher viscosity materials because at some point, your pump may run too, too fast, and if it's running too fast, it'll get into a starvation mode where the pump wants to be fed more. It wants to be fed at higher than a 50% intake efficiency at all times. If you don't do that, this animation or this picture below is actually fantastic because it shows you the starvation effect. This is what cavitation looks like in a progressive cavity pump. You actually have vapor bubbles that are formed, and due to the pressure, they explode onto the rotor here because the pump is trying to pull more fluid than it possibly can through that pump, okay? It's almost like trying to uh, drink an extremely thick milkshake through a tiny straw. It's just not happening. It wants to, it wants to accomplish it. It really wants to pump more, um, but it just can't. The material is too thick, and the pump is running too fast. So how to compensate that is either to increase the size of the pump and then run it at a lower RPM, or just take that specific pump. If you run it at a lower RPM, you will reduce that cavitation. It will allow the product to feed that pump easier. And this is an example here, a 
of what our engineers look at when sizing something. If they find out that it's uh, a thickened sludge of 30% solids, you know, they'll be looking at the volumetric or what we call the intake efficiency curve based on speed and pressure. Poll question number two. Okay, number two, why are PC pumps very accurate? A, low slip and low shear due to compression fit. B, lower horsepower requirements. C, expensive parts. Or D, longer wear parts usage. We're almost at 90%, so a couple more seconds. Okay, and hopefully everybody got this right. The answer is A, low slip and low shear due to compression fit. We had 91% get that, so back to you, Chris. All right, so when we look at the minimum recommended volumetric fill efficiencies, okay, your intake efficiency is gonna be critical. The higher the efficiency loss, the greater the chance of a flow variation. So when we're looking at an application like a transfer application, so moving uh, something like a secondary sludge, waste activated sludge, we don't really need a 50% intake efficiency, but when you're getting into an extrusion application or moving something that is a high, high solids rate, like um, like cake, okay, you really wanna have a high intake efficiency. And there's different things that we do with the pump design to help make sure that that happens, okay? And some of the things that we do, and you'll notice these maybe on the other end of a dewatering device at a wastewater plant, such as a belt filter press or a centrifuge, is we have open hopper style pumps. You can see the suction area of this pump where my mouse is, is um, much, much larger than some of the other pumps that we've showed you videos of today. Okay, so in order to help increase the intake efficiency of these pumps and get it as close to 100% as possible, we open up the suction of the pump and then we add in an auger here where the coupling rod used to be. So on a flange pump that would be moving a waste activated sludge, you would just have a connecting piece here that we call the coupling rod with some joints, okay? But for the larger uh, viscosities, we have to use an open hopper pump and we use an auger that turns at the same speed as the rotor and the stator. And that helps take that thicker material and compact it into this area and then provide a higher intake efficiency for this pump. The last bullet point here is probably the best way to describe it. You use this auger to stuff the first cavity of this pump. Okay, so again, the rule of thumb, you saw that video of the dead duck earlier and some of the potatoes and the cheeses and the lotions, those were all open hopper style pumps. As long as we can get that product into this uh, hopper area, the pump will do its job and we'll move the fluid. Okay, poll question number three. Why are PC pumps a better choice than conveyors for heavy solids or cake transfer? A would be odor control, B would be accuracy, C would be less expensive, D would be lower capital investment, and E would be all of the above. give a couple more seconds. And the answer is E, all of the above. Great, 85% on that, good job. Back to you, Chris. All right, perfect. So now we talk about the drivetrain and that's basically the relationship between the pumping element here, which is the rotor and stator, 
and the actual motor side, okay, which is import, importing that force to make sure that that rotor and stator will turn. So typically we have a gearbox here. Most of the pumps nowadays that are manufactured have a gear motor on it from a company like Nord or SCW. And that gear motor there has the gearbox, which then is connected to the rotor and stator by a coupling rod with two joints on it. Different pump manufacturers have different style of joints, um, but the majority of the market I would say now are similar to uh, the vehicles that we drive. They use a pin joint um, to help accept that transfer of power from the motor end to the rotor. So you have an eccentric motion, it's a side to side and a rotational motion of the rotor. When we're sizing these joints as pump manufacturers, we need to take into account the thrust force and the rotational forces, hydraulic torque and stator drag, and the overhung loads due to the eccentric motion. So when we size these pumps, we need to make sure that that joint is properly sized in order to be able to overcome your discharge pressure in order to be able to pump the various fluids that we have, and then to be able to take that transfer of energy from the motor end and the gearbox over to the rotor and the stator. Most of the time, if there was issues with these joints, we would be looking at the suction side of the pump, not the discharge side. If there was issues with progressive cavity pumps and they had joint issues, it sometimes would be noisy. We would be looking at what's going on in the suction side of that pump. And then here's two animations of the typical two types of styles of progressive cavity pumps on the flange side that you would see out there. The one on the top is the more popular version. You would see these at uh, the majority of wastewater plants. That would be a block design or a close coupled design between your dry vent and the actual pump itself. The motors, as long as you go up to about seven and a half horsepower, do not need support. They just hang off of the base plate of the pump. The gearbox face and the pump lantern, um, they're close coupled for ease of installation and the um, gearbox bearings are supplied to take the thrust and the radial loads so there's no actual bearings in the pump itself. Those are in the gearbox. When we look at the other types of pumps that are out in the market, sometimes that's from a, a high heat point of view or when the gearbox itself cannot handle the um, actual forces in the application here, you would extend that for additional support. And so this would be a long coupled installation here on this bottom, um, this bottom animation here with the bearing housing design. This typically makes it a longer pump. It, it takes up a larger footprint. So again, we don't see a ton of these um, out in the field unless it's absolutely necessary. Now we talk about the stators of these pumps. Different pump manufacturers manufacture their stators in different ways, um, but the majority of them can go up to temperatures of 350 degrees Fahrenheit. These stators, depending on what the elastomer is made out of, you know, out in the field for sludge, you'll see buna. For sodium hypochlorite, you'll see Viton. For polymers, you'll see a combination of Viton or um, Buna, sometimes EPDM. And some of the other um, stators on um, getting towards the exotic side that are being used in abrasive applications, you'll see urethane being used a lot more for um, sludge applications that have a high level of grit or sand. Um, you'll see urethane being used, and you'll also see a material called Therban being used a lot now on stators as well. Um, so stator choice is huge, especially when you're dealing with higher temperatures because you don't want a stator that's going to swell or expand. If it swells or expands, it could lock up the rotor while the pump is actually turning, and that would shut that, that, would shut that pump down. And two, on the opposite side of that, if your temperatures were to get below uh, a certain temperature range that that stator can take, it will sometimes shrink. And if it shrinks, now you lose your compression fit between the rotor and the stator, and the pump will have internal slippage or won't be able to overcome its discharge pressure. Um, so because that stator is bonded inside of a metal tube, 
the rubber can only swell in, inward onto the rotor or shrink away from that rotor. So either way, we wanna make sure that as a pump manufacturer, we have enough information about that application to make sure that we size the right stator material, first of all, and second of all, find the right rotor that can be compatible with it. Because if we know the stator is gonna swell, then we'll undercut the rotor and vice versa. If we know that the stator is going to shrink due to a certain temperature, we'll oversize the rotor. Um, in order to keep that compression fit. Okay, question number four, folks. How do progressive cavity pumps compensate for wear on abrasive applications? A, reduce the speed of the pump or increase the pressure stages. B, increase the speed of the pump or decrease the pressure stages. C, none of the above. Okay, we'll give a couple more seconds. A few people are still voting. Okay, the answer is A, reduce the speed of the pump or increase the pressure stages. Okay, Chris, back to you. Okay, so now let's talk about the Achilles heel of this type of pump. Uh, technology. So we've gone through plenty of the benefits uh, today. We've done a, a really basic overview of how this type of technology works. Every pump technology has a weakness or has an Achilles heel. For progressive cavity pumps, it's really the run dry situation or what we call sometimes the starvation effect on the pump that can damage it. It's a simple pump. It's a workhorse that wants to be fed at as close to 100% intake efficiency as possible. If you can feed these pumps at 90% or more intake efficiency, you're going to have a happy pump. Um, however, you cannot run these things dry. So there's a lot of different things that pump manufacturers have done to try to protect the customer and their investment in the product. And some of these things are little devices. Uh, you can see the animation here. This is a probe that the manufacturer that I work for, CPEX, makes. And this is what we call our dry run protection probe and it constantly senses for temperature inside of the stator. So you can set a nice um, delta there and understanding that the range, if the pump was operating and it's usually at 50 Fahrenheit, let's say, you can set this so that when the stator gets to maybe 70 or 80 degrees Fahrenheit, it will just trip the pump. Um, so you can be pretty conservative in how you program this. But that's one way that if you were ever in a situation where you might run the pump dry by accident, someone could maybe close a valve, maybe the um, sump that you're transferring out of is now starting to get towards the bottom, you've dewatered it. Um, you really want to avoid running these dry. So this probe here constantly senses for temperature. You can set it on a high and a low range and it will trip the pump if the probe senses that temperature range. Some of the things that can also happen um, to the stator as it runs dry, it will build up enough heat that you will see there'll be chunking, there'll be splintering, uh, you know, serious degradation here of the stator because a lot of heat starts to get built up. When you have a piece of rubber that's so tightly compressed, 20 thousandths of an inch compression on a piece of metal, and you don't have any fluid that's lubricating that, can build up some serious heat over time. And once the stator is toast, the pump really cannot move any fluid anymore. Um, so the last one, besides uh, running it dry, um, if there ever was a chemical attack, we don't have a, a picture here. I'll probably teach that in a level two or level three course. But if there was um, you know, swelling, hardening, pitting, anything else that looked funky in that stator when you pulled it off of a pump, there could be um, chemical compatibility failure. And so that would be a simpler fix because you're just trying to find an elastomer that is compatible with what you're trying to pump. I've really only seen this when pumping new chemicals or you know, I would say my first time pumping sodium hypochlorite, we experimented with a couple different elastomers and found out that Viton, 
uh, H5 Viton is um, the best material for it. Before that, we did see degradation with Hypo on um, some stators that were made of um, Buna and EPDM. But a lot of um, pump manufacturers will allow you to send in a sample coupon. And um, what we'll do is test that fluid for you with maybe six or seven different elastomers and then choose the best one that will be most compatible on our pump and provide the longest life. But again, a workhorse pump, uh, very basic in how the technology works, extremely effective when you know pumping on the wastewater and on the water treatment side, sludges, thickened sludges, cakes, sodium hypochlorite, um, polymers, any sort of other disinfectants, and uh, don't rule out your lime slurries and really tough applications like diatomaceous earth as well. But the number one way to kill these things is by running them dry. Hey, we've got two questions here. Question number five, what is the highest percent dewatered sludge slash cake that a PC pump can handle? A, 5%, B, 20%, C, 30%, D, 40%, and lastly, E, 50%. Yeah, keep this open for a few more seconds. Okay, and the answer is E, 50%. Great, okay, the next question. Question number six, what is the number one failure of a PC pump? A is seal failure, B, cavitation, C, run dry, D, airlock, E, motor overheating. Okay, I'll leave it open for just a couple more seconds. And the answer is C, run dry. 91% of people got that. Okay. okay. Chris, we do have we do have some questions here. Oh yeah, I forgot about the questions, Kevin. Okay, question number one. How well does the pump handle sludge with a lot of wipes? Yeah, so with uh, the wipes, what we would want to know is maybe when that were to turn into some type of a ball or combine in the sludge application, we would want to know what that diameter um, would look like, and we would size the cavities on our pump large enough to handle something like that. Uh, the pump runs at a fairly low RPM. So as far as the rag entering that pump, it's probably going to enter in a ball up state. Um, we're on plenty of primary sludge applications that have rag issues. And due to some new designs with the progressive cavity pump technology for deragging as well, there's a lot of things we can do if that were to get hung up on a coupling rod. But the number one thing we would want to look at is just sizing the cavities large enough to transfer um, a rag that would maybe turn into a, a balled up state and um, effectively move that through the pump. Okay, question number two. Can you touch base on the pump efficiency compared to other technologies? Yeah, I mean, for progressive cavity pumps, we're not really looking uh, on the efficiency side like you would with a centrifugal pump. So um, for us, we would not consider it to be an, an extremely energy efficient pump. We're efficient on the side of we have extremely tough materials, viscous materials, abrasive materials that need to be conveyed, need to be transferred in a laminar fashion. And that's where we would fall into play. So if you're looking on the energy efficiency side or the horsepower, we actually consume a fairly low horsepower when the pump is running. It does take though a very high brake horsepower. It takes a very high starting torque uh, to get these pumps running because when the rotor sits inside of that stator, it is such a tight compression fit. 
that you need a ton of force just to break it free initially. And then the actual horsepower requirements when the pump is running are lower drastically. Um, but yeah, CPEX and other progressive cavity pumps, you would not be looking at us on the energy efficiency side, but more on the transfer efficiency and um, the overall application of moving something that's thick and viscous or abrasive uh, and giving a constant laminar feed to whatever part of that process is, whether it's a dosing application uh, or feeding something like a dewatering press where it wants to see that nice laminar um, feed flow. Okay, great. Uh, question, Chris, when the pump is cavitating, what do you think will wear first, the stator or the rotor? So the stator will definitely wear first. The rotor is going to see somewhere because of the vapor bubbles that may be exploding. But the biggest thing when a pump is cavitating is you will notice that noise. I touched on earlier in the presentation that these pumps are relatively quiet when they operate. That's 100% true. They're very, very quiet pumps. You really only hear the fan on the motor. If you are hearing a thumping, a whacking, a thwacking sound, uh, that's a no-no. That means that that pump is being starved at some point and the noise is actually the uh, vapor bubbles exploding inside of the uh, cavities as the rotor and the stator are turning. And it's also the noise that the pump is making trying to really pull more fluid into the pump. It wants to be more efficient. It wants to get more fluid into it. So if you had a slightly closed suction um, valve, before the suction housing of the pump, and the pump was trying to pull through as much fluid as possible, you would start to see rattling, you would start to see um, some flap, some flapping or whacking noises in that rotor and stator. And the first thing that would go would be the stator. You might see some chunking, um, some bits and pieces that would fall off of that stator. And then the second thing that would go is the rotor, but you would actually see it destroyed along the seal lines where the rotor and stator actually form that compression so you wouldn't see the wear in the cavities in the actual pockets but on, along the seal lines there is where you would see some serious um, degradation due to the cavitation okay uh, another question on your rule of thumb what would your rule of thumb be for the lift on this pump i know you mentioned 28 but conservatively speaking what can they look at yeah, it really depends on what we're moving. If it's a thicker product, we want to stay between the 10 and 15 foot um, suction lift, whereas with the you know thinner fluids, we can pull a lot higher suction lift capabilities. You also would look at the diameter of your suction pipe. Uh, if you can keep that on the larger side, that will actually be healthier for the pump as well from the NPSH A point of view. Um, but it actually is quite impressive. Uh, we have plenty of these pumps and I myself have put them in for really interesting applications that you wouldn't think you'd have a, a suction lift on like polyaluminum chloride, um, for instance, um, as chemical that you would never do a suction lift on though would be sodium hypochlorite. Um, but for us with these pumps, the thicker the product, you know, we would run it at a low RPM. Once that pump is primed, then you can speed it back up. So if you wanted to dewater, uh, uh, you know, a pump station that had some, you know, a little bit thicker uh, sludge in there, for instance, and you want to transfer it, you would just run this pump at about 50 RPM till it's primed, and then you can speed it up to do the actual transfer. What's also nice about these pumps is once it's primed, it stays primed due to that compression fit still between the rotor and the stator. Okay, great. Now, on the abrasive slurries, what's your preference for the flush plan for a mechanical seal? Yeah, so typically um, what we would use is like a John Crane mechanical seal with a flush port on it, and operators a lot of times will use just their plant water to flush that out. Uh, other times when we're pumping something like, a, like a, again, a sodium hypochlorite or something that could maybe chalk up on the seal faces, a lot of times you'll see a mechanical seal with a tiny little quench pot on the side of it as well. That's just used when the pump is not turning or operating. It can keep the seal faces clean. Uh, a lot of this stuff would be customer um, driven as far as the mechanical seal choice or the overall seal choice. Some customers really like back to back double mechanical seals as well. What's really nice about progressive cavity pumps is they're extremely flexible as far as what seal choice um, the customer really wants. We can recommend some as a manufacturer and a 
certain flush plan, but a lot of times this can be um, customer driven or engineering firm driven as well and can be installed uh, on the pump in um, various ways. Um, but in other words, it really won't stop us um, as far as an application if there is a mechanical seal preference as far as vendor and type. Okay, good. Uh, next question, what happens is if, if a slug of sludge has time to dry in the line or in the stator while it sits, can the pump overcome this on startup? Really depends on what the VFD settings are. Uh, the pump itself, if it's given enough torque at startup, enough to break the rotor stator free from its set, um, then it will do that. So a lot of times you want to look at whatever the VFD is, and if it's direct online, you want to make sure, again, it has enough torque to break that free. On the discharge side, uh, you just want to be careful because the pump is really simple. It's going to keep on working as hard as it possibly can to move fluid down that pipe. So if you have a blockage on the discharge line or if you have a closed valve, anything of that type of situation, this pump is going to continue to turn and try to move fluid down that line until it either breaks that clog free, uh, breaks that valve, or maybe something back on the joints of that pump due to the a thrust load there will um, damage the pump as well. So that is probably one of the more dangerous situations that you could have with any positive displacement pump in general. Um, you definitely don't want to have a blockage in the line or have a discharge valve down the line. These these types of pumps will just keep on working as hard as possible until something eventually breaks. Okay, and with regards to that, do you recommend a relief valve on the discharge side? Yeah, that's definitely recommended. Uh, it will not only be on, the, on a safety factor, a much safer application, um, but it's also a way to protect the uh, investment on this type of equipment as well as to have some type of recirculation um, pressure relief valve. Okay, great. Uh, it appears to be the last question. When the pump's running forwards or backwards, and this is two parts, when the pump's running forward or backwards, is there any difference in the pressure output and then do you recommend check valves? So I do recommend check valves, uh, especially if there was a time when you wanted to inspect these pumps or have to do a rotor and stator change. You know, you would maybe put a check valve on um, the side of that pump. Um, however, you do not need that check valve. Um, whether you're running the pump forward or reverse, it has the same pressure capabilities. If we were running in reverse, one of the things that we would look at is what that discharge pressure would look like on that mechanical seal because your seal that sits uh, in the suction housing is now going to see your discharge pressure. Typically when we run in flooded suction applications the seal only sees the, um, the suction pressure which a lot of times is gravity fed so not very high um, but if we're going to reverse rotation and now that seal is going to see your discharge pressure that's really what we would be concerned about, not on the pressure capabilities of the pump, because the rotor and stator are still gonna act in the exact same way. Each one of those pockets is gonna hold 15 PSI um, worth of discharge pressure. But the other elements of the pump, if you're running in reverse, need to be looked at, um, mainly just concerning the, the seal. Okay, super, I think that's it for questions. So. Okay, right. so quick reminder, um, the handouts are um, in that little tab. When we close out, you'll have to fill out the evaluation. And if by chance you can't fill out the evaluation or you're unable to download the handouts, um, you will get a follow-up email in an hour with the link to do all that. So Chris, thank you very much. Kevin, thank you so much for being on. Perfect, yeah, thanks everyone for your time. Thank you for attending.